Hi, everybody. Pastor Paul LaFontaine and Literal Life Church in Petersburg, Michigan, would like to invite you to take the next half hour and enjoy some time in the Word of God. If you're hungry for more of Christ, we believe you can be fed, and we pray that you'll be blessed. Visit our website for more information at literallife.church. May God bless you, my friend, and may the music and message encourage you today. If I know me, I'd still be in the boat Scared to death, trying to stay afloat And I never step out on the waters Of that raging sea If I know me by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. So Solomon has went by this man who has this vineyard and he's seen it grown over. I want you to remember that term. It's all grown over. 
with thorns and nettles covered the face thereof, and the stone thereof was broken down. And then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Now, you, it's strange that you would look at a man's yard and vineyard and garden and receive instruction, but God can speak through anything. I received instruction, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy, and thy want as an armed man. You know, there are some lessons sometimes that we get by reading, um, by hearing preaching, by hearing teaching. We not only receive lessons, but we receive revelation from the word of God. And so there are, there are channels that God has given us for us to get lessons from. And most of the time it's from reading and hearing and preaching and teaching. But then there are some lessons and instruction and even revelation that we get in everyday life. And that's the everyday life uh, by experience. And a lot of that experience is not just going through things ourselves, but observing the life of others, watching the life of others. We can receive instruction by watching the life of others. And we can, we can receive wisdom by looking at the fruit of other people's lives and uh, how they are acting, how they are responding. And we watch it more than what we'll give up or what more than what we'll admit sometimes, that we're very observant of other people's lives. And uh, often uh, we compare ourselves. And the Bible says, talks about comparing yourselves. And everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses and get what the next person has. So in doing that, we're always observing. We're always looking. And those who are on social media are always watching someone else. And whether we realize it, we, we learn from that and we take instruction from that and we can be influenced from that, and we watch how people act. And so we can be watching from t sometimes uh, and watch not just a day, not just a moment, but we can watch for uh, many, many years from a distance. We can watch years unfold in a person's life, and then we can see the end result of a person's life, and we can observe and see, the, we can watch them for years, and then we see the end result of what direction they went and what they did, and we can see the fruit of that. And uh, sometimes when we look at a life, we're impressed. Sometimes we say, we conclude and say, you know what, if I would like my life to end, I would like to end, it to end that way. Um, sometimes we're attracted to a life and we say, I would like to be more like that. There's several mentors in my life that I, that I look to and I've looked up to, and uh, many of them, some of them are even in this church, but many of them around the world. And I'm glad that God put somebody there because Paul said in the Bible, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow, in other words, if Christ is in that person and you see the fruit of them growing in the fruit of Christ, then we realize that's a person to follow. That's a person to look to. And I've said, I, said, I, wanna be, I, want, I don't want to be like that person. I, I tease preachers sometimes because I'll, I'll say them even sometimes when they're younger, but when I see something good in them, I tell them, I want to be just like you when I grow up. And uh, they kind of chuckle at that because they say the same thing back to me, but that's, a, that's something that we look at because we, as we get older, we look at and we observe things and we see good things. And so we're, sometimes we're impressed with watching people's lives, but sometimes we're disappointed. And then we learn from that and watching them and we conclude, I don't want to be that way. I don't want it to end up that way. I don't want to take the same path that that one took. Uh, I remember uh, in the Bible, there was a, one of the patriarchs, I believe it was Isaac, or excuse me, um, Jacob. And uh, uh, he, he had said when his sons went and uh, uh, took the, the men of the city and the, one of them had violated their, uh, their sister. And so they went, all the brothers, and they went and uh, circumcised all the men and, 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 and killed some of them. And uh, the daddy didn't know they went and did it when they come back. He said, you shouldn't have done that. And then he prayed. He says, Lord, let me not come into that type of anger. That's the way he quoted. He says, Lord, let me never come into that type of anger. So he's saying, I've seen what they've done, but oh, Lord, I don't want to take that path. And sometimes you can look at a life and say, I know I don't want to take that path. And sometimes you see the path they took and you see the end result. And when you see the end result, then I know I don't take that path. This is what Solomon did here in the text when we read that he got a huge lesson by walking by someone's garden, someone's yard. Solomon walked by a vineyard 
And he's seen the garden not kept up. He's seen the garden was not kept up, so things were falling apart. And there was weeds growing, and there was nettles growing, and there was thorns coming up. And so he's seen the vineyard, and he's seen this garden was not thriving. It wasn't producing like it should. It wasn't beautiful like it should be. And he observed it and said he's seen things uh, overgrowing and things coming out. And, uh, and, so, and I'm sure that person that owned the house and vineyard, they started out, they wanted a beautiful, every person wants a beautiful vineyard or beautiful yard or a beautiful thing. Um, you know, but we all realize that if we watch all the, if we, if we look in all the magazines of the beautiful landscape yards, uh, it doesn't happen uh, just by a picture. Can I get an amen out of that tonight at least? You know, you can look at it all you want to, but it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. And then once you get it in and it looks beautiful, then it takes a lot of work after that to keep it thriving, to keep it beautiful. Can you say amen? That's why I don't like gardens. I don't like to plant all this stuff because there's, you know, weeds that come up and things. And so I in the family get left with weeding and why have a garden when it's going to be all suffocating with weeds and all that? And that's just a personal little uh, trouble that I have with gardens. But you see now, uh, Solomon said it's, it's evident that this person in this... So Solomon, he looked at the garden and he looked at this and it was actually a reflection of the person a bit. Now that seems a bit critical, but... <clears throat> But it, but it is your life and you, your your home and your life and your finances and things like that. It can reflect something that might be lacking in your life. And people get defensive when you talk about it. But Solomon's doing that. He's walking by this, and I'm sure it was a nice person. I'm sure they had a great goal to have a vineyard, to have a beautiful fruit coming from it, grapes and all. But it was evident that the person in the house was not willing to put in the time it takes to keep it flourishing and to keep it growing. And there was visible outside things that became a reflection of the person in the house because he made that diagnosis. He right away called him a sloth. He said, he was, this is a slothful person, and he did it by looking at what was taking place outside. Uh, and so, so now the, the visible outside became a reflection of the person in the house. And Solomon said he's slothful. He's, and, and slothful means lazy. And uh, a slothful also means the lack of courage, I thought this was interesting, an interesting meaning to laziness, because we look at laziness a certain way, but in the spiritual way, laziness is a lack of courage and zeal for the great things God has in store for those who love him. God has great things in store. God has more fruit to bear from your life. When Jesus in John 15 was speaking about abide in the vine, you shall bring forth more fruit. And then he goes and said, then you'll be pruned and you'll bring things, even more fruit. Can you say amen? And then he says another stage, he said, you'll bring forth much fruit, more fruit, much fruit. And as God keeps pruning us and we keep yielding and he keeps cleaning the garden and all these other things, he wants us to bring forth more fruit. Love him. How many know that God has great things in store for them that love him? We know that, can you say amen? But we want, don't want to offer a slackness or a slothfulness or a laziness towards God when we know that there are weeds growing in our garden, when we know that there's something that's growing within us and we won't address it, we'll let it overgrow everything. We can't ignore it, can you say, man? We have to be willing to say, if I want the results that God has promised me, then I got to be willing to take these weeds and things in my life and really be serious with them. And then he says the end result will be poverty and an armed robber, that's what it means there. The end result of that person's life will be poverty. So in other words, they were getting fruit there from their garden. But after all the weeds grow up and take away, he has no fruit, he has nothing to eat. And so now he has to go to extreme measures to steal food from someone else. An armed robber would go steal food. An armed robber, if they're not, if, listen, let me say it this way. I'm, and I'm jumping quickly through things here. If they refuse to make their own garden flourish to feed themselves, so they'll start stealing from others or bumming off of others or mooching off of others. Let me say this. If, if, if you don't get the Holy Spirit yourself, then you'll mooch off the Holy Spirit from somebody else. And you can't do that. They said, give us of your oil. We don't have enough for ourselves. Go and buy and get your own oil. Amen. So now we can't mooch off somebody else. This is your own garden. This is your own place to flourish. 
This is your own spiritual walk. And, and guess what? If everybody falls by the wayside, you're not going to want to be depending on them. Can you say amen? If you have to stand alone, you want to say, Lord, I'll stand with you. And this is my garden. And I want my garden to flourish in the name of the Lord. So this text could be taken many ways. It has good lessons in it that I could preach many ways. It has good work ethic. I could preach on that. It, 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 it shows what it leads to. It leads to poverty. I could preach this text and preach about procrastination. Procrastination. I could preach about business. I could talk about wealth. I could talk about good gardening. It's all in there. But that's not my subject tonight. My subject is pulling crabgrass. Because I hate crabgrass. I hate it. And this, this lesson tonight that I want to take from this scripture is about thorns and nettles and crabgrass and things that we need to weed out and they're not being weeded out. This is a spiritual lesson in laziness, spiritual laziness, to not root out things that take over a good spirit-filled life. You're not willing to address what it is that's starting to grow slowly, not willing to do it and ignoring it. And you can't thrive spiritually. My subject is pulling crabgrass because I hate crabgrass uh, crabgrass is trying to be real grass, and it's not real grass. It doesn't look like real grass. It looks close sometimes, but it's not real grass. It's crabgrass, and it gets right in the middle of real grass, and it makes it look bad. And this fella in Proverbs was not willing to see it and to do something about it. And if you don't deal with it, it begins to take over. It begins to keep growing. And the term is grown over everything else, grown over. And that's, that's what you got to look at is that when these things are let go in your life, then they grow over the other things, grown over. They're not meant to be there. They're squelching you spiritually. They're holding you back, and they grow over everything else, and it breaks a, makes a real uh, bad journey. So this thing of addressing our spiritual life and our garden started at the beginning when in Genesis 2.15, it says Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden to dress it and to keep it. He put them in the Garden of Eden to dress it. So this is part of the original plan of God. And I know that was a literal Garden of Eden, but it has a spiritual connotation. So don't leave this part out that God puts a man and woman in a garden to dress it and to keep it. And the word keep, of course, means to guard it. So there's a certain guard you put over it from animals getting in. or well, That's why they put a wall up sometimes. They put, that's why they put certain fake animals to scare other animals, a scarecrow or whatever. But what are you doing? You're guarding your garden. You're guarding it when you're asleep. You're guarding it when you're away because other things could get in and destroy your garden. He put them in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, to guard it. But, but to dress it, uh, he said, to, I put them there to, to, to guard it. But to dress a garden means to preserve it, to preserve it. And to preserve a garden, you have to pull things out that don't belong there. That's what Adam and Eve were given as a commission, to, to dress and to guard, to preserve, to protect. This is what they were given. And we don't have those things literally today. We have a spiritual inheritance. We have a spiritual place that God is planting seeds. How many knows where the, the, the mind is the womb to the soul? The mind is where the seed is planted. We want it to drop from the mind to revelation, but it starts in the mind. And when the mind is all messed up and the mind is too busy and the mind is confused or the mind is filled with pornography or the mind is filled with people that hurt you or the thinking life is filled with all kinds of trash, God can't plant that seed properly in you because your mind's all messed up. So we're guards over our minds. We're preserving our minds because that's the bedding ground to plant God's seeds. Can you say amen? So this vessel is a garden of God. This vessel is, a, is this garden that he's given us to, to dress and to keep and to guard over and to watch over our minds and to watch over our spirits because God is wanting to bring forth more fruit from our lives. So crabgrass is actually similar to, similar to that nettles and that's why I use the text because a, a crabgrass is a creeping grass. I don't even like the name already, the meaning. A creeping, a creeping grass. If you're real grass, you don't need to creep. 
It's just something devilish about that whole thing. Creep. You don't have to creep. You just grow up as healthy grass. But when you're creeping, there's already something wrong with you. You got to go. It's a creeping grass that can become a serious weed. Guy says crabgrass is appropriately named as it often grows low to the ground, spreading outwards. You're supposed to go upward, and you're spreading outwards, resembling a crab. And that's where crabgrass. And the legs just to kind of grow out from it. And like this nettles, it just keeps growing and growing and takes over, and it sucks the life from the good things. And so uh, I, don't, I won't go on, but I'll just say it's got to be pulled up from the roots. Can you say amen? It's got to be pulled up from the roots. There's no other way to deal with it. And if we don't deal with, I'm going to be direct, if we don't deal with our defenses, our thorns, our anger, our resentment, our crabbiness, our victim mentality, our negativity, our complaining, our crabbiness, if we don't deal with it, it will just keep growing in our life. And I know this is a simple message to you tonight, but it's where the rubber meets the road. If you ignore the crabgrass in your life, it'll take over the good that's in you. It'll smother out living in the spirit of God. We can't be lazy, can you say amen, about something in our life that's irritating others and irritating us. It should be irritating you. And we can't be lazy about that. It's going to keep growing, and it's time to get it out and to root it out and to say, well, some people say, well, that wasn't, that wasn't really me. Uh, I've had a bad week. That really wasn't me. Well, if it wasn't really you, then get it out of you because it's taken over your garden. You be, be, people say, that, well, that I acted out of place, but that wasn't really me. Well, if it wasn't you, then why did you do it? If it's not a part of your garden, it's not a part of your plan, it's not a part of your vineyard, doesn't fit the word, don't be criticizing somebody else. Look at your own garden and say, do I have some crabgrass here? Do I have some nettles here? Do I have some thorns in my life? Can you say amen? That I'm ignoring and it's becoming irritating to my wife or to my husband or to my children. Praise the Lord. I used to make fun of people, old people especially, that got down and I'd watch them all day in their front yard, in their gardens, and in their landscape, down on their hands and knees. I laughed at them for years because they're, 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 they're there pulling everyone out, pulling everyone out for hours in the heat. And I laugh because as a young person, you say, you know, there's other things for that. You know, I was going to title this message tonight, The Young Use a Weed Whacker, The Old Pull It Out from the Roots. I said, I thought all those years, I've been laughing at those people and I'd be getting the weed whacker and thinking that's, the, that's, the, that's solving the problem. And you know why we choose it? Because it's the easy way. We choose the weed whacker because it's a quick. And now we got batteries. I got the battery weed whackers. You don't have to string the cord all the way out there. It's got a good battery. You can go for a long time and you weed whack off the top of the weeds, but you're not pulling it out by the root. Now I'm describing many, many Christians today that are willing to come in a service and the weed whacker knocks the surface things off and you feel good for a while, but nobody hardly is willing to stay with it until God, you say, God, I want you to root this out of my life. But when you get older, you don't think in the terms of young because you realize all the years, I'm whacking that off. It's not doing any good. I'm going to have to get down as an old person, even not even when your back problems, everything else, I'm going to have to lay down there like they're doing, and I'm going to have to grab that and pull it out by the roots. Is anybody listening to what I'm preaching here tonight? I'm going to stay with it. If you need the Holy Ghost, you're going to stay with it until God gives it to you. If you need a deeper walk with God, you're going to stay with it. You're going to keep bringing that prayer for, before God. If you've got habits in your life, say, God, I'm going to stay before your throne until you take this habit away from me, Lord. Amen. You don't quit, can you say amen? You don't give up. When you've got a garden and you want it to flourish, you don't give up. You keep working at it. May God help us to keep working at it. I rejoice when someone is willing to be honest and submit. We have many in this congregation, and I like the atmosphere Maybe it's because that's the way I lean, but I like people who will get real honest and real submissive to say, I want to get to the bottom of my issues.
and why I'm acting the way I'm acting. Sometimes it ends up, I need the Holy Ghost. But sometimes it's not that. Sometimes that you're ignoring something that Satan's using. You're given certain territory. And when we cross into this promised land of a life of the Holy Ghost, no territory belongs to Satan at all. you got to go take it. When they stepped over Jordan and they had the whole land before them, that new generation, and God encouraged them and says, I will be with you as I was with Moses. What a charge that should give to your hearts. Can you say, man, to tell Joshua, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. You go and take it every place the foot your goes. Every place your foot will get upon is your ground. Satan can be ran out of there. And then later on in Joshua, as they conquered many of the lands, he, Joshua, when he, when he was old, he says, stand up. He says, listen, tell the rest of the tribes of Israel, how long will you be slack concerning the promise? There's still so much more land to possess. You read your Bible, that's what it says. There's still land to possess. How many believe there's still land in your life to possess? Yeah, we're still here. There's still land to possess. So we got to be up and going. We can't lay back. We can't give up. We can't get lazy now. No, it's too late to get lazy. We got to take this whole promise. And territory that Satan is squatting on, we got to say, I'm going after him. I'm kicking him out. I'm taking the land. I'm taking all of me, body, soul, and spirit, memory, imagination, conscience, affected reason. See, taste, feel, smell, and hear. Can you say amen? Belongs to God. I'm going to give it back to God. I'm going to take my territory away from Satan because I want my garden to flourish in the Lord. I want to be a well-watered. I want to stay in church so I can say, keep the moisture. Can you say amen? I want to stay in my Bible because I can start. You feed me the right nutrients. Can you say amen? You people have those gardens and you're, you're a lot better than I, I am at it. I know that. But you know, and you've got to put certain nutrients in it. That's why we read our Bible. God, I need some nutrients today because I, I got a garden here. I want to dress it. I want to, I want to pull the crabgrass out. Speak to me something, Lord. And I want to come to church and raise my hand and get under the moisture of the Holy Spirit so I can be watered, so I don't become dry. Can you say amen? You have a garden in your life Sons and daughters of God. That was Adam and Eve's commission to dress and guard it. You have a garden in your life, and it can be grown over with the wrong things. But I'm here to tell you, it can flourish. When we can't discover what it is and we can't pull it out, he says, step aside. If you let me, I'll pull the root out for you. Good thing we don't have to do this gardening on our own. But his Holy Spirit would just navigate our lives and say, yeah, there it is there. Would you like me to take that from your life? How willing are you for me to take that jealousy and that crabbiness? How willing are you? And when we're willing, he says, step aside, I'll pull it out of you. Thank you for watching our message today. If you would like more information, please contact us by visiting our website, literallife.church. And if you would like to come and visit us in person, consider this your personal invitation. We're just 15 minutes north of Toledo at 11,100 Summerfield Road in Petersburg, Michigan. God bless you, my friend, and have a blessed day.